welcome to another edition of In the Word of God, and have we got a good one for you. Coming today out of the book of James, chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10, the origin of war and contention against pride, submission to God. But the central theme of the topic today will be, what are you fighting for? Once again, that will come out of the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. So before we go into this, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord God, we come to you with heads bowed down in humble submission to say thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for all that you are doing for us. And thank you for all that you are going to do for us. We ask that this word will reach those who are in need. Help them to understand what it is they're fighting for and why are they fighting Lord we thank you that you have kept us throughout this week throughout this day carrying us into the night asking that you continue to watch over us give your angels charge over us throughout the night keep us protected from all hurt harm and danger seen and unseen let this word minister not just only to those who hear, but let this word also minister to me as I send this word forth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. What are you fighting for? Start with verse 1, and it reads thusly. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, and kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. Yet ye may consume it, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteress, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Hallelujah. May you be blessed by the reading of God's word, and more importantly, the doing. The former chapter speaks of envying one another as the great spring of strifes and contentions. This chapter speaks of a lust after worldly things and a setting too great a value upon worldly pleasures and friendships as that which carried their divisions to a shameful height. The apostle here approves the Jewish Christians for their wars and for their lust as the cause of them. Whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? James 4 and 1. Jews were a very seditious people and had therefore frequent wars with the Romans 
and they were a very quarrelsome, divided people, often fighting among themselves, and many of those corrupt Christians against whose errors and vices this epistle was written seemed to have fallen in the common quarrels. Hereupon, our apostle informs them that the origin of their wars and fighting was not, as they pretended, a true zeal for their country and for the honor of God, but that their prevailing lusts were the causes of all. Observe hence, what is sheltered and shrouded under a spacious pretense of zeal for God and religion often come from men's pride and malice, covetedness, ambition, and revenge. The Jews had many struggles with the Roman power before they eerie entirely destroyed. They often unnecessarily embroiled themselves and then fell into parties and factions about the different methods of managing their wars with their common enemies and hence it came to pass that when their cause might be supposed good yet their engaging in it and their management of it came from bad principles. The worldly and fleshly lusts raised and managed their wars and fightings, but one would think, here is enough said to subdue those lusts, for one, they make a war within as well as fightings without. Impetuous passions and desires first war in their members, and then raise feuds in their nation. There is a war between conscience and corruption, and there is war also between one corruption and another. And from these contentions in themselves arose their quarrels with each other. Apply this to private cases, and may we not then say of fightings and strife among relations and neighbors, they come from those lusts which war in the members. From lust of power and dominion, lust of pleasure or lust of riches. From some one or more of these lusts arise all the broils and contentions that are in the world. And since all wars and fightings come from the corruptions of our own heart, it is therefore the right method for the cure of contention to lay the axe to the root and mortify those lusts that war in the members. Secondly, it should kill these lusts to think of their disappointment. You lust and have not. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. James 4 and 2. You covet great things for yourselves and you think to obtain them by your victories over the Romans or by suppressing this and the other party among yourselves. You think you shall secure great pleasures and happiness to yourself by overthrowing everything which thwarts your eager wishes. But, alas, you are losing your labor and your blood. While you kill one another with such views as these, inordinate desires are either totally disappointed, or they are not to be appeased and satisfied by obtaining these things desired. The words here rendered cannot obtain signify cannot gain the happiness sought after. Note, hence, worldly and fleshly lust are the distemper which will not allow of contentment or satisfaction in the mind. Thirdly, sinful desires and affections generally exclude prayer and the working of our desires towards God. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You fight and you do not succeed because you do not pray. You do not consult God in your undertakings, whether he will allow them or not, and you do not commit your way to him and make known your request to him, but follow your own corrupt views and inclinations. Therefore, you meet with continued disappointments, or else, point number four, your lust spoils your prayers and make them an abomination to God whenever you put them to him. James 4 and 3 says it like this. 
You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust, as if it had been said. Though perhaps you may sometimes pray for success against your enemies, yet it is not your aim to improve the advantages you gain so as to promote true piety in religion, either in yourselves or others, but pride, vanity, luxury, and sensuality are what you do or what you would serve by your success and by your very prayers. You want to live in great power and plenty in voluptuousness and a sensual prosperity and thus you disgrace devotion and dishonor God by such gross and base ends and therefore your prayers are rejected. Let us learn hence in the management of all our worldly affairs and in our prayers to God for success in them to see what our ends see that our ends be right. When men follow the worldly business Suppose them tradesmen or husbandmen, and ask God and ask of God prosperity, but do not receive what they ask for. It is because they ask with wrong aims and intentions. They ask God to give them success in their calling or undertaking, not that they may glorify their heavenly Father and do good with what they have, but that they may consume it upon their lust, that they may be and able to eat better meat, and drink better, and wear better clothes, and so gratify their pride, vanity, and voluptuousness. But if we thus seek the things of this world, it is just in God to deny them, for as if we seek anything that we may serve God with, we may expect he will either give us what we seek, or give us hearts to be content without, and give opportunities of serving and glorifying him some other way. Let us remember this, that when we speed not in our prayers, it is because we ask amiss. Either we do not ask for right ends or not in right manner, not with faith or not with fervency. Unbelieving in cold desires, beg denials, and this we may be sure of, that when our prayers are rather the language of our lust than of our graces, they will return empty. We have fair warning to avoid all criminal friendships with the world. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. James 4 and 4. Worldly people are here called adulterers, adulteresses, because of their perfidian, perfidiousness of God, while they give their best affections to the world. Covetousness is elsewhere called idolatry, and it is here called adultery. It is a forsaking of him to whom we are devoted and espoused to cleave to other things, there is this brand put upon worldly mindedness that it is enmity to God. A man may have a contempt, a competent portion of the good things of his this life, and yet may keep himself in the love of God, but he who sets his heart upon the world, he who places his happiness in it and will conform himself to it and do anything rather than lose its friendships. He is an enemy to God. It is constructive treason and rebellion against God to set the world upon his throne in our heart. Whosoever, therefore, is the friend of the world is the enemy of God. He who will act upon this principle to keep the smiles of the world and to have his continual friendship cannot but show himself in spirit and in his actions to an enemy to God. You cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6 and 24. Hence, arise wars and fighting even from this adulterous, idolatrous love of the world and serving of it. For what peace can there be among men so long as there is enmity towards God? Or who can fight against God and prosper? Think seriously with yourselves. 
what the spirit of the world is. And you will find that you cannot suit yourselves to it as friends, but it must occasion your being envious and full of evil inclination, as the general generality of the world are. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? James 4 and 5. The account given in the Holy Scriptures of the hearts of men by nature is that their imagination is evil, only evil, and that continually. Genesis 6 and 5. Natural corruption principally shows itself by envy, and there is a continued propensity to this. The spirit which naturally dwells in man is always producing one evil imagination or another always emulating such as we see and converse with and seeking those things which are possessed and enjoyed by them. Now, this way of the world, affecting pomp and pleasure and falling into strifes and quarrels for the sake of these things is the certain consequences of being friends to the world, for there is no friendship without a oneness of spirit. And therefore, Christians, to avoid contentions, must avoid the friendship of the world and must show that they are actuated by nobler principles and that a nobler spirit dwells in them. For if we belong to God, he gives us more grace than to live and act as the generality of the world do. The spirit of the world teaches men to be churls. God teaches them to be bountiful. The spirit of the world teaches us to lay up or lay out for ourselves and according to our own fancies. God teaches us to be willing to communicate to the necessities and to the comfort of others and so as to do good to all about us according to our ability. The grace of God is contrary to the spirit of the world and therefore the friendship of the world is to be avoided. If we pretend to be friends of God, yea, the grace of God will correct and cure the spirit that naturally dwells in us, for he giveth grace. He giveth another spirit than that of the world. We are taught to observe the difference God makes between pride and humility. God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James 4 and 6. This is represented as the language of scripture in the Old Testament, Old Testament, for so it is declared in the book of Psalms that God will save the afflicted people if their spirits be suited to their condition, but will bring down high looks, Psalms 18, 27. And in the book of Proverbs, it is said, He scorneth the scorners and giveth grace unto the lowly, Proverbs 3 and 34. Two things are here to be observed. One, the disgrace cast upon the proud. God resists them. The original word, antaste, signifies God's setting himself as in battle array against them. And can there be a greater disgrace than for God to proclaim a man, a rebel, an enemy, a traitor to his crown? In dignity and to proceed against him as such. The proud resist God in his understanding. He resists the truth of God in his will. He resists the truth of God in his will. He resists the laws of God in his passions. He resists the providence of God. And therefore, no wonder that God sets himself against the proud. Let proud spirits hear this and tremble. God resists them. Who can describe? the wretched state of those who make God their enemy. He will certainly feel with saying, sooner or later, the faces of such as have filled their hearts with pride. We should therefore resist pride in our hearts if we would not have God to resist us. The honor and help God gives to the humble, grace as opposed to disgrace, this honor this God gives to the humble. And where God gives grace to be humble, there he will give all other graces 
And as in the beginning of James 4 and 6, he will give more grace. Wherever God gives true grace, he will give more for to him that hath and useth what he hath a right. More shall be given. He will especially give more grace to the humble because they see their need of it, will pray for it and be thankful for it. Such shall save it for this reason. We are taught to submit ourselves entirely to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James 4 and 7. Christians should forsake the friendship of the world and watch against that envy and pride which they see prevailing in natural man, and should, by grace, learn to glory in their submissions to God. Submit yourselves to him as subjects to their prince in duty and as one friend to another in love and interest. Submit your understandings to the truths of God. Submit your wills to the will of God and the will of his precept, the will of his providence. We are subjects and as such must be submissive not only through fear but through love, not only for wrath but also for conscience sake. Submit yourselves to God as considering how many ways you are bound to this, and as considering what advantage you will gain by it. For God will not hurt you by his dominion over you, but will do you good. Now, as this subjection and submission to God are what the devil most industriously strives to hire, to hinder, so we ought with great care and steadiness to resist his suggestions. If he would represent a tame yielding to the will and providence of God as what will bring calamities and expose to contempt and misery, we must resist these suggestions of fear. If he would represent submission to God as a hindrance to our outward ease or worldly preferments, we must resist these suggestions of pride and sloth. If he would tempt us to lay any of our miseries and crosses and afflictions to the charge of providence so that we might avoid them by following his directions instead of God, we must resist these provocations to anger, not fretting ourselves in any wise to do evil. Let not the devil in these or the like attempts prevail upon you, but resist him. And he will flee from you. If we basely yield to temptations, the devil will continually follow us. But if we put on the whole armor of God and stand it out against him, he will be gone from us. Resolution shuts and bolts the door against temptation. We are directed how to act towards God in our becoming submissive. To him, James 4, verses 8 through 10. First, it tells us, draw nigh to God. The heart that has rebelled must be brought to the foot of God. The spirit that was distant and estranged from a life of communion and converse with God must become acquainted with him. Draw nigh to God. In his worship and institution and in every duty he requires of you. Secondly, cleanse your hands. He who comes to God must have clean hands. Paul, therefore, directs to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 1 Timothy 2 and 8. Hands free from blood and bribe and everything that is unjust or cruel and free from defilement of sin. He is not subject to God who is a servant of sin. The hands must be cleansed by faith, repentance, and reformation or it will be in vain for us to draw nigh to God in prayer or in any of the exercises of devotion. Thirdly, the hearts of the double-minded must be purified. Those who halt between God and the world are here meant by the double-minded. To purify the heart is to be sincere and to act upon this single aim and principle, rather to please God than to seek after anything in this world. Hypocrisy is heart impurity, but those who submit themselves to God are right, will purify their hearts as well as cleanse their hands. Fourthly, be afflicted 
and mourn and weep. What afflictions God sends, take them as he would have you, and by duly sensible of them. Be afflicted when afflictions are sent upon you, and do not despise them, or be afflicted in your sympathies with those who are so, and in laying to the heart and in and in laying to heart the calamities of the church of God. Mourn and weep for your own sins and the sins of others, times of contention and division are times to mourn in, and the sins that occasion wars and fighting should be mourned for. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. This may be taken either as a prediction of sorrow or a prescription of seriousness. Let men think to set grief at defiance, yet God can bring it upon them. None laugh so heartily, but he can turn their laughter into mourning. And this, the unconcerned Christian James wrote to or threatened, should be their case. They are therefore directed, before things come to the worst, to lay aside their vain mirth and their sensual pleasures, that they may that they might indulge godly sorrow and pen, penitential tears. Fifthly, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Let the inward acts of the of the would be suitable to all those outward expressions of grief, affliction, and sorrow before mentioned. Humility of spirit is here required, as in the sight of him who looks principally at the spirits of men. Let there be a thorough humiliation in bewailing everything that is evil, that there be a great humility in doing that which is good. Humble yourselves. We have great encouragement to act thus towards God. He will draw nigh to those that draw nigh to him. James 4 and 8 and he will lift up those who humble themselves in his sight. James 4 and 10. Those that draw nigh to God in a way of duty shall find God drawing nigh to them in a way of mercy. Draw nigh to him in faith, in trust, in obedience. And he will draw nigh to you for your deliverance. If there be not a close communion between God and us, it is our fault and not his. He shall lift up the humble. Thus much our Lord himself declared. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Matthew 23 and 12. If we be truly penitent and humble under the marks of God's displeasure, we shall in little time know the advantages of his favor. He will lift us up out of trouble, or he will lift us up in our spirit. Comfort under the trouble, under trouble, he will lift us up to honor and safety in the world, or he will lift us up in our way to heaven, so as to raise our hearts and affections above the world. God will revive the spirit of the humble, Isaiah 57 and 15. He will hear the desire of the humble, Psalms 10 and 17. And he will at last life them up to glory because honor is humility. The highest honor in heaven will be the reward of the greatest humility on earth. Hallelujah. What a word. Again, Lord God, as we conclude this, I say thank you for allowing me to be a vessel to send forth your word to your people. Once again, let this ministry be a blessing to those who hear it. But let this also minister unto me and keep me ever reminded to humble myself before you so that in due time you can exalt me 
Help me to let my light shine before men that they may see my good works. But glorify the Father, which is in heaven. Thank you once again for tuning in to this podcast. I hope it has been a blessing to you. In the Word with Anthony Smith. I thank you for taking out your time. And I will be back again with another word from the Lord. So until next time, be blessed.